Hi everyone, it's Joe here from Lawn Solutions Australia and welcome to this episode of Turf Talk where I'm joined by the General Manager of Coolabar Turf, Scott Spedding. Scott, welcome. G'day Joe, thanks for having us. Um, now, Coolabar Turf, let's start there. Who is Coolabar Turf, what do they do, where are they and what are they all about? Coolabar Turf is a turf production facility located in northern Victoria, so we're based in and around Echuca. Um, we're about 290 hectare farm, 220 hectares of turf production. Um, and the company's been in existence for 22 years, been a family business up until recently. Um, and um, we're really excited to continue that legacy moving forward. Um, we predominantly service uh, landscaper, DIY and commercial clients, so local councils and um, commercial projects, developers, that sort of thing, as well as uh, help build Aussie backyards, which we absolutely love because we get the opportunity to change people's lives one backyard at a time. So that's what gets us out of bed every morning. Yeah, great. And and as a general manager, uh, your role is essentially overseeing? Um, yeah, it is. It, it's predominantly an operations role. Um, yeah. I have a little bit to do with everything, um, yeah. but not much to do with anything. So um, <laughs> every, every day for me is pretty varied which is exciting um i have my weekly catch up with all my team um as our business has grown over 20 years i um i guess i was privileged to come into the business nearly six years ago now mm -hmm. um and like a lot of small family businesses um under undergoing growing pains um mm -hmm. i sort of came in um my background is actually software originally um and then moved into business operations and um I look for ways that you can assist a business to be more efficient, but um, what is paramount for us at Coolabar um, is customer service. So yeah. just because you can do something efficiently doesn't mean it's going to drive a great outcome for the customer. So our focus is purely everything we do is based around the customer and ensuring that we maximise our value to them, um, that they're going to get an awesome result and an awesome product. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, that we can do it with um, an efficient team and obviously make that scalable. So um, like all businesses facing increasing cost pressures or that sort of stuff, that's sort of my job um, is to just keep an overarching view on all of those yep. inputs, um, make sure we maintain um, our customer focus and our value mm -hmm. and that our product quality um, remains second to none and that's what our, uh, you know, our customer base can rely on us for. I'm, um, I'm glad you brought that up because that's going to take us into sort of where we're going to where this episode's going to end up is we've spoken to a lot of people who have been owners and founders and workers on a turf farm and it's been a very turf heavy discussion but you've implemented some pretty significant changes on a business that's gone through massive growth in the last few years so I think um, it's going to be a nice change to go from a from a purely a turf discussion to something a little bit more businessy um, and we'll get into that a little bit later on but just as some context for people um, we've had a, a, a lot of people uh, you know, owning and working in turf farms on this podcast so far. But uh, from a production standpoint or a sales standpoint, Coolabar Turf is a really large turf farm. Um, in and amongst our network, they're the they're the biggest seller of premium turf brands in Australia. So I think it's important to establish that context before we get into anything else is we're talking about a 50 plus staff That'd be right. Um, yeah, generally we, we sit about between 45 and 50 staff depending on seasonality. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, it, it, it's yeah. a big operation and it's in a pretty tricky place uh, to grow grass. I don't know if anyone's been to Echuca, but why don't you explain a little bit of the, the climactic challenges you face growing grass in a in a place like Echuca? Yeah, well, we've probably got one of the best summers, um, so growing seasons for warm season varieties in the country. So, um, you know, the, the, the founders um, of Coolabar, Brad and Sue Shearer, which um, people that have been in the industry would know, they, they, they're they not in Echuca by accident. They're, mm -hmm. they're there because um, it is a really good production climate. Mm -hmm. um, so from late October through till April, um, we, we probably arguably got one of the best um, climates for growing warm season varieties. Mm -hmm. um, low rainfall, which means that our inputs are controlled so yep. we can get the moisture content and moisture level applications mm -hmm. in a production sense uh, pretty much bang on through irrigation. Yep. We're on the, you know, again, one of the most reliable irrigation systems, the Goulburn system mm -hmm. um, in the country. So um, water allocations, continuation and affordability is, is really good in that region as well. Mm -hmm. um, and soil profiles are a variation of that. So the, the big challenge then comes for us in winter because we'll go anywhere down to sort of minus seven with a frost um, mm -hmm. over that winter period. So essentially, if you think we've got a 
grow 12 months worth of production in four or five months of the year yep. and then warehouse it. So mm-hmm. you obviously can't pop turf in a box and sell it when you need it. Yep. So being able to maintain the quality of the product um, and the turf in the paddock over that. Um, our guys out on the farm and our farm teams, um, again, arguably do the hard yards probably more so than a lot of other farms yeah. around the country. Yep. Yeah, that, that's sort of what um, – I was getting at before is it's it's very hot and dry and very cold and dry um, through the winter and through the summer. And I've been there going to Coolabar Turf for a long time now and I've seen a, a lot of different methods used over the years to try and mitigate the effects of the cold winter. I saw a helicopter flying around there once, not sure what it was doing, but probably a joyride at the time. But yeah, it was, it was look, a something. few of the guys got the opportunity to go up in it. But um, uh, other hort um, crops use helicopters, so uh, vineyards and um, orchards. So we're mm-hmm. just east of us, so about 50 Ks East is um, sort of from Kyabram across to Shepherd and Cobram is a huge stone fruit area. Right. And in that um, early spring, uh, so that budding season, they're trying to protect their bugs and the buds and they've used helicopters as a frost mitigation tool in the past. We gave it a crack, um, yeah. which such big broad acre that we got, it, it didn't work and it, yeah. it's not um, it was financially fun. sustainable. That's fine. Um, got a great photo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, we've also tried frost fans, um, mm-hmm. but again, because of the low canopy of turf, um, you know, you're sort of inch, couple of inches off the ground. Yeah. The ability to get that air movement down along the ground was was challenging mm-hmm. with that technology. Mm-hmm. So um, we still resort to cloth. So we we use uh, we call it frost cloth. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, for, for intensive purposes, it's like a shade cloth. Yeah. Um, we've got about 15 hectares of that that our team pull out on the ground just manually. Big, big blanket. Big blanket. Yeah. Tuck it in, put some pegs in. Um, I hope we don't get too many windy nights. It causes much grief because <laughs> the guys don't love coming in and seeing <laughs> yeah. it all rolled up against a fence and yeah. uh, have to straighten it out again. Um, but, yeah, really that's what we're using to provide that winter protection. Mm. And, uh, you know, this this current season I think we're well into the 30 frosts. Wow. Um, okay. You know, probably 10 to 12 of those were severe yeah um so yeah on a warm season plant in in a production environment Uh that that does set us back a little bit once you get that out of the production environment into a home lawn no nowhere near as much an issue because generally you've got buildings fences trees those sort of things providing a bit of protection but in a production sense where you've got a 20 hectare paddock uh with no protection um you're you're more susceptible to it for sure but so it's a lot of work that goes into ensuring a green product year round um so frost blankets are one of them it's also farms in different locations as well Uh, i imagine you guys have put together to mitigate some of that as well yeah we've got a stunning little farm actually probably 40 k's from our main production facility and um it's out just off the side of the murray river um on the gumbow creek mm-hmm. more of a sand profile out there so our soil temps um different and it's sort of surrounded by water so we actually see a little bit of a microclimate there yeah and um yeah that's we've, we've seen some initial good results in some frost mitigation out there just because the water actually has a warming effect when it's that cold, the water actually holds a bit more of a maintainable temperature. So that's providing us a bit of a microclimate. So um, challenge then becomes about managing your crop rotations and everything to make sure you're out there at the right times of yeah, year and yeah. returns and things. So it's never just as simple as what, uh, you know, most most farms, farms further north, they probably get more rotations than us. We, we work on average one rotation a year. So yeah. essentially we're getting one harvest yep. and then spending the rest of the year growing that in again mm-hmm. to be able to harvest again the next year. No, there's, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into it, particularly on the scale that Coolabar turf is. And I describe it to people, it's not a turf farm, it's a turf factory uh, the way I see it. It's... It's very perfect. Um, it's very big and very perfect, and you and you pump out a lot of grass. So it's a credit to the team uh, for the work that you guys do. There, it really is something worth seeing if anyone ever gets a chance uh, there in Achuca. But um, back onto you. So, like I said, it's probably not a traditional journey for a turf farmer in Australia. Turf business in Australia, by nature, a lot of them are family run and family operated. Uh, Coolabar Turf has been for many years now, but that's since changed. But you're very entrenched um, in the Coolabar business and the Coolabar brand um, over the last few years, and you've made a lot of change. But it wasn't always turf uh, for Scott Spedding. So, so what did what path did your career take you on, and how did you get to where you are now? Because it's a bit of a unique change from software into running a, a large turf farm. Well, yeah, it is, and um, I, I should say my software career is very short lived because. Um 
yeah, I felt I had a bit much of a personality to be a software coder, so I lasted my 12-month traineeship on that and then uh, wanted to come out of the dark room. And um, I actually sort of moved more into network admin and then that led um, – I worked for a great organisation back then that had internal opportunities. Um, so I started working more in the operational side of the business um, and then I took on a branch operations role. So I was sort of managing uh, remote sites and staff. The IT sort of being the backbone of my reason to be there, but um, – that became a bit of team management and those sorts of things. And then I, um, my hobby is uh, car rallying. I was organising um, car rallies uh, for the Victorian Rally Championship on a voluntary basis um, and I ran an event over in Mansfield and some guys came to that event that were part of the national championship. Um, they thought that I'd put together a pretty good event and approached me to go and work full time for them running um, the Rally Tasmania down out of Burnie um, yeah, right. and a couple of events down there. So I, I did... Some people say, you know, it's awesome, but, um, you know, do what you love and you never work a day in your life. So I thought, yep, here's the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, I probably never worked harder doing 20-hour days. And, um, yeah, it, it was a great opportunity because I went from having an employed team or, or working with employed people to a huge voluntary mm -hmm. base. So I learned a lot about people and what motivates people yeah. as well as working in a field that I loved. Um, but... Yeah, that bit of separation from family. Um, my now wife was located in Melbourne at the time, so I had a lot of travel backwards and forwards. So decided to make the move back to Vic. Um, mm -hmm. And through that rallying, um, had met uh, a few people in business and came back and worked in that operational sort of role um, and supply chain management, general management um, yeah. in Melbourne for eight or nine years. Yeah. And then we decided to move back to Echuca, which is I'm from near there originally, and I came back working for myself um, and just did what I think anyone in any business knows you've got to do is the phone doesn't ring, you've got to make it ring or you've got to get out there and pound the pavement. So I was just picking up the phone and cold calling local businesses of which Coolabar Turf was one. Mm -hmm. um, Susie Shearer picked up the phone who uh, was the, the then owner and um, as I touched on earlier, they, they were probably going through um, some growing pains within the business and just needed a bit of hand in that backroom business so, operations So when stuff, you say you're so. cold calling, cold calling offering what exactly, IT solutions? Was that no, the just um, my tagline was make shit happen. Um, <laughs> okay. So pretty much, I, you know, and they're the sort of businesses I wanted to work with that it cut through. Yeah. Um, so I made the phone call and I'm like, well, what do you do? And I'm like, I, I, I get shit done, I make shit happen. So mm -hmm. what's on your to-do list and what can I help you achieve mm -hmm. that you're not getting to? Mm -hmm. And that probably resonated well with Suze at the time. Um, you know, they, as I say, the rest of history, we had a couple of meetings um, and I had some other clients doing the same thing. So it was basically working with business owners mm -hmm. and just helping them tick off things on their strategic plan essentially. So um, when I first went into Coolabar, it, it was really obvious that their back-end systems weren't keeping up with their production facility. So yeah. um, Brad and the farm team had done an amazing job of expanding the farm and and embracing automation. Um, so that part of the business was doing really well. Um, it was more about the scalability, the back end of the business. So how do we how do we take this? Um, and most turf farms uh, aren't just turf farms. They're, they're managing sales, marketing, finance, and transport. So they're, they're reluctant transport operators as well. Mm -hmm. So being able to manage all of that and all of those resources efficiently, yeah. um, I, I guess I put a systemized approach over that. And then we decided to embark on writing our own custom software within the business, drawing on my background as a project manager um, and working with an external software development partner to do that. So what we wanted was a no compromise solution yeah. um, in the business that it would do exactly what we wanted to do. Um, and I guess Coolabar from that has benefited now for five or so years and we're sort of yeah, looking sure. to embark on a refresh of that journey. And, you know, for me, really exciting, I guess, agriculture as a whole, but also within turf production is automation yeah. and um, IoT or Internet of Things as well as being able to bring all the facets of our business together so you've got one view of your whole business, which is sort of where we're heading. Because what you touched on before is an important point, and a lot of people don't understand this about turf farms. When they think turf, they just think agriculture. And most agricultural businesses, their job is just to grow the product. Yep. Someone in comes and buys it all and takes it to market. Where turf's very unique. So it's an agricultural business, it's a production business, it's a massive logistics business, a sales business, a marketing business, all under one roof. And um, automation on the farm 
side of things has been pretty prominent in the turf industry Australia with auto stackers, auto sprayers and that sort of stuff. But coming in and making farm, talk to logistic, talk to sales, talk to marketing would be a pretty big job because I'd imagine a business like Coolabar, if you stack them up with other logistics businesses in the area, they're probably one of the biggest logistics businesses going around too with the freight they're using. So Yeah, as I said, we, we are in a bit of a food bowl region. So there is a lot of product moves mm, in and out right. and around our region. So mm. for that, we're actually lucky because of that, it gives us, again, some scalability within our capacity so we can flex yeah. uh, in the season. So coming into November, December and again in the traditional, um, I guess, turf laying mm-hmm. times of year, um, so spring and autumn, um, you know, the fact that you can actually install turf all year round now and our production facilities sort of maintain that and have allowed that to happen. Um, but we've still got those peak seasons. So um, we run sort of nine, ten trucks of our own daily but, we could have up to 20, 25 trucks sort of yeah. moving within our business. So making sure the harvest is going to match the, the transport um, and that then our logistics, all those movements. And, you know, there's huge compliance within all of those areas now as well. So obviously occupa- occupational health and safety, but as well as um, transport compliance and things within industry. Um so they're all things we grapple with um, and, yeah, then the sales and marketing side of it as well. So, yeah. you know, people sort of say, what do you do? And I'm like, well, if, in a food sense, we're paddock to plate. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're end-to-end or vertically integrated business, um, which even in agriculture we're starting to see more of. People want to know the origins um, from a quality control perspective. It's important for us to understand where that bit of turf came from, when and who and how. Mm-hmm. So um, if there ever was an issue, we can track it back and um, – Quality assurance um, yeah, sure. is big for us. So, yeah. yeah, which automation is and you know GPS, all that sort of stuff's really helping with. So, so you walk in and you tell Susan Brad, you know, I'm going to make shit happen. I'm going to get all this sort of done. And how long did that take before you actually started wearing the cooler bar shirt? Was that was uh, that a gradual was, thing? Was yeah. it or because? Um, yeah, look, it, it was. Um, I, I worked as a, I guess, a contractor within the business for probably 12 months and um, Suze is pretty convincing and she kept saying, <laughs> I've got a shirt for you, I've got a shirt for you. And I'm like, look, I sort of uh, wanted to do my own thing. But I guess the opportunity to work with um, a business like Coolabar with their progressive views mm-hmm. and, and look to growth, um, obviously passionate about law myself. So the, the product and the quality thing resonated well with me yep. and, and the customer service. So, so I felt they had a really strong brand and it was something I wanted to be part of. So I guess that final step to decide to pull on the shirt, yep. um, you know, I sort of said to them, yeah, I'll be here for 12 months and yep. we'll flesh this out and six years later still enjoying the journey. Um, my role now has probably become a little bit more day-to-day, but it's always there to make sure that we continue to maintain that continuous improvement and yep. always ask how can we do things better without compromising customer service and or quality of product. So, And what was the biggest eye-opener for you about the turf industry coming from the industry that you've come from, which is um, virtually totally, totally different in yep. the most ways of the turf industry? What was, your, what was the biggest eye-opener for you coming into a big ag industry like turf? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question because um, I guess coming out of in- industry, I wasn't uh, I didn't have blinkers on, so I was pretty open to what the opportunities were to improve. But um, as I said, I, I was already sort of you know, happy to see how automation was starting to work in in the turf industry. Yeah, um, I think we still got a long way to go. Like um, in that, like labour continues to be a continual challenge. I think it's for all businesses. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, for me, it's how we can continue to optimize those things so um a, a big thing is is often people saw it as a cost of business um you know oh, i've got to go and buy another computer or i've got to spend money on a software yeah. subscription yeah. and um i think i was really lucky within cooler bar that um you know brad and sue's the owners actually saw the value in the that what would have normally traditionally been seen as a cost. Yeah, sure. Um, so that resonated well and I think then the business has leveraged as well off that. So mm-hmm. I think people need to realise that you can take that IT or um, technology investment off the 
expense side of the P&L and almost push it up um, into yeah, the right. asset onto the balance sheet because right. its ability to scale and return mm-hmm. is, can be huge. Yeah, and it's a, yeah. it's a unique way of looking at things and a way without being disrespectful to turf farmers is probably not the traditional way turf farmers have viewed it like you said before. And I think what you've done at Coolabar is is pretty pioneering uh, in the industry and and to take a business with with massive organic growth and to systemize things like you've done is, is pretty cool. And I think um, – Getting to see it firsthand, um, I get to see a lot of turf farms around Australia. And um, without saying this, because you're a meter away and within striking distance, <laughs> you've done a you, you've done a really good job, and 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 the machine works, yep. uh, which is cool. So, um, just looking forward now for Coolabar. So the last five or six years, the business in a lot of ways has gone through a lot of very very significant changes. What's the plan for the next sort of two to five? Is it about steadying the ship a little bit and, and just cruising along or are you always looking to do something a little bit different? Look, I think we're we're a growth business. Mm-hmm. Um, I continue to talk to our team about that. So we yep. want to continue to grow. Um, and for me, it, it's important to always make sure that um, your team's growing with you, that you've got a team that is happy to adapt and change um, yep. because we – you know, I, I continue to challenge everyone on our team daily. I guess just because we did it that way yesterday, should we do it that way tomorrow? Yeah, sure. um, so you know, I can't thank the team enough for coming on the journey as well. Mm-hmm. So we've we've had a really adaptive team, and almost to the point now that they're the ones challenging me, which is. Great. Awesome. That's where yeah. we want to get to. Yeah. Um, so into the future, we will continue to to grow. Um, we want to make sure that we've got the right products for the market, and that's why our relationship with Lawn Solutions is so important mm-hmm. because um, of the R and D work that that you guys are doing and that we're um, assisting with in the yep. background. So um, you know, we want to make sure that when we are talking to our customer base, we can promise them that we've got the best variety mm-hmm. um, for that purpose for. for for their needs and yep. they're going to get the best outcome and bang for buck. So um, I guess that's what gets me out of bed. Um, you know, we're an important part of our local economy now, yep. um, being a fairly big employer, mm-hmm. um, but really proud to wear the Coolabar badge as well. And I think most of our team are as well, where they're, you know, don't know whether you remember that old gas ad where the guy said, oh, where do you work? And it was gas and fuel and the whole barbecue went quiet. I think our team are pretty proud to say they work for Coolabar Turf. Yeah. Um, uh, to their family and friends and in the community and that's what we're passionate about is, um, you know, I think continuing to be involved in the community, continuing to um, make sure that we don't lose sight of mm. the value and the products that we get to deliver to our customers every day. Yeah, no, it, it, really, it really is a strong brand, not just in the local community but across the state uh, as well. Coolabar Turf has been for a long time, built by Brad and Sue Shearer and like you said before, um, once you get into the sort of the the realm of Susie Shearer, there's no getting out of it uh, <laughs> yeah. very easily. You get yep. sucked in pretty quick. But um, you've you've obviously done a great job continuing that legacy on which they built uh, over the last two decades. The whole team has, and it's a it's a credit to you all. And just on innovation, because you are a bit of an innovator, Cooler Bar Turf's an innovative business. Where do you see? Again, question without notice. Um, where do you see the next big step in innovation in turf businesses, whether it be production or whether it be in the office or whether it be in logistics? Where do you see as the next big step for yeah, us? Yeah, I, I, I think it is in automation across whole of farm. So really the industry's only adopted harvesting mm-hmm. um, and, you know, yeah, we're down to one operator, but we've got to look across, um, you know, the rest of the the production cycle. So everything from, you know, growing, um, so, you know, weed mitigation and those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, the environmental pressures for us are real and we're, we're really, um, I guess, aware of wanting to continue to reduce our environmental footprint. So yep. whether that be across inputs, so um, looking at um, just ways to, benefit from soil, soil biology, um, so smarter farming, mm. less inputs, um, and then utilising automation. So whether that be through spraying, um, weed identification, mowing, all of those sorts of things. And, there, you know, there's um, ag farm and farm machinery is coming a long way rapidly yeah. in that automation space yeah. and autonomous, so mm-hmm. not just, um, you know, basically unmanned operation. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, I'd love to see the day where we're running our farm from a control room because from a HR perspective and a safety perspective, that's awesome. Yeah. But you can't beat that human touch. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it still continues to be just such a big area of focus for us that the guys that are sitting on our harvesters or that are operating a cart off tractor to get that pallet from the paddock back to the shed to go on a truck or the, the person that's loading that pallet onto the truck, yeah. um, I don't think will ever replace humans for that finesse um, yeah. and that last check on quality. So for me... 
the human factor is always going to be really important, but it's probably those lower value repetitive jobs mm -hmm. that we can automate is where yeah. we need to, um, yeah. to continue to be efficient, but also sustainable and more environmentally friendly. Yeah, I, I agree. It's important, the, the monotonous tasks. Um, we, we take on automation where we can, but you can't beat um, the human looking at the product and saying, hey, that's right, that's not, that's right, that's not, and fixing it up that way. And uh, the way I see it, I think mowing is probably the next big one uh, for us. There's a lot of innovation in our industry now around autonomous mowing. It's it's getting bigger in the residential market with with auto mowers and the like. But I think we've seen a lot. Um, we we're lucky enough to go to the US earlier this year at the World Ag Expo, and I think mowing is probably the next big one uh, yeah. where we're going to see a lot. We got to see a demo. I won't name the company, but we got to see the demo uh, for fully autonomous mower, and they had a human dummy uh, where they showed the safety features of it and there's about 20 of us standing there and they put the human dummy in front of the mower, mower and straight over the top of it and spat it out into a million pieces. So that wasn't a very good demo. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and this yeah. is the challenge that we've got. So um, yeah, when you're looking at something at seven meters wide, um, yeah. the, the risks are a bit realer. So yeah. <laughs> obviously there's still a bit of work to do, I think in that space, but that that is emerging also IOT. So just knowing your actual inputs into your, your square meterage within, um, you know, within a lot of other industries, within ag yield is mm -hmm. everything. Um, yeah. and and we're probably, as an industry, we're not great at hmm. managing our yield and understanding the exact inputs into yeah, those sorts of things. Great. So, yeah. um, you know, I think we've got a lot of work to do there as well, um, yeah. which we're excited about embarking on internally. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, we'll, we'll just sort of see where that goes. But you don't always want to be on the bleeding edge of that stuff as well. So yeah. we're sometimes happy to let, you know, it's good the US are doing some of that stuff and they yeah. can do the trial and error mm -hmm. and then hopefully we can <laughs> um, we can sort of leapfrog a bit off the back of that. So, um, you know, people, but yeah. they are doing some pretty awesome stuff over in Europe and that sort of thing as well. So traditionally we've probably always looked to the US, but I think Australia um, has opened its eyes a little bit to what's going on in Europe within yeah. ag and that sort of thing yeah, as well. Yeah, particularly so, our industry. Yeah. Um, it, and it stemmed from the research side of things. I think that's that, that initially got us to the US, the turf grass research, which people who listen to this podcast will heard us talk about before. But because we're there now, we're starting to see all these other brilliant things with automation. So I think it's going to be pretty exciting. And um, just a slight a slight segue, um, my only experience with rally cars is WRC to Extreme on the PlayStation yeah, when I was about eight game. years old. Yep. So good game. Colin uh, McRae rally. So. So, yeah, yeah, that's right, Colin McRae. Yep. Uh, so how do you get – uh, someone in IT or software, disrespect, um, into rally cars. Where'd that come um, about? And is it still a thing for you? Yeah, look, it is probably not as much as it used to be. Um, so I was, I've been lucky enough. Uh, I had a cousin that was into rallying um, when I turned 18, so I was silly <laughs> enough to say, yeah, I'll jump in the co-driver seat or the silly seat yeah. or the ballast seat, whatever we want to call it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I think in that first rally we made it 13 and a half Ks. It was a night event um, down in Gippsland and we snotted a tree, so it was a pretty short <laughs> um, a short event. And for some reason I thought, geez, that was fun. Yeah. And um, then – there's actually and still is a shortage of co-drivers or navigators in rallying in Australia yeah. um, and I had the opportunity then to join a, a bit more of a local team uh, with another young guy that had, he'd come out of go-karting so he, his race pedigree was pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, so I jumped in a Datsun 1600 with him and I think we won the Victorian Tour Drive Championship oh, wow. um, in mm -hmm. our first year and then went on to win the 2010 Victorian Rally Championship with him, uh, Nathan Reeves in a Subaru WRX right. back then. I know one of them is, um, yep. Yeah, yep. Um, <laughs> Keep it up. Yeah, that's it. And then, um, yeah, I don't know, another mate that I'd met through, again, just through the sport, um, he sort of said to me, oh, do you want to jump in? And he'd, he'd actually been an ex-Australian Rally Champion and just wanted to go out and have a bit of fun. So right. um, he bought a car Was a, in 2014. It was an Evo 10 Lancer, um, which was – actually built by a team in WA and had won the Asia Pacific Championship the year before that car. So we were lucky to get into a really solid car. Yeah. Justin was a good driver and um, we just went out and had a bit of fun that year and managed to win the the 14 championship as well. So uh, as well as that, I'd, I'd stuffed around and spent too much money, I guess, like anyone that's <laughs> ever ever been in motorsport. Um yeah. I had an early model Evo as well that I ran in the autocross championship as a driver back in uh in So you do some driving as well, you're not just yeah, telling I had, the I'm always yeah. a frustrated driver. So you know right. you always think you can drive faster than the bloke sitting next to you in yeah. the in the silly seat. But I think that's what sort of helped um make successful pairings um, mm -hmm. in, in the navigator seat or the co-driver seat is that you've got a bit of an understanding about what the car's doing yeah, and sure. how it's doing yeah. and you can actually assist the driver or give some feedback on car setup or braking and those sorts of things and while I'm certainly no expert, um, it, I think that worked well um, as well as just 
having a bit of fun with it. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people take some things too seriously. So for me, outside of work, that was sort of my release to have a, cool. have a bit of fun. It's very unique. It, yeah, it yeah. is, and it's um, it is. It's it's a great thrill, and if you're with someone safe and fast, and you know, lucky enough to have <laughs> safe and fast, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and you're lucky enough to have, you know, um, both of those guys had some resources around them that meant that they had quick cars, mm. um, and they were both talented drivers. Yeah. Um, but then also really enjoyed my, I guess, opportunity to work on the admin side of the sport. Um, yeah. So I got to be clerk, of course, of a few cool events, um, and I, I ran Safari Command. We called it on the Australasian Safari, which was a seven-day uh, rally in uh, Western Australia for bikes, quads, and cars, and trucks, and those sorts of things. Right. So um, that was a pretty cool event. And yeah. um, logistically, again, one of those learning things that you do about a lot of moving pieces. Yeah, um, you know we that event on reflection and every year it pops up in your Facebook feed, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, whatever you're doing mm -hmm. this. And, um, you know, you're sort of in command of two aeroplanes, two helicopters, like a heap of ground vehicles, 500 volunteers on the ground, plus all the mm -hmm. competitors as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, get to see some amazing parts of Australia through that as well. So it was a pretty cool event to be part of, yeah. but again, just logistically mm -hmm. and being able to picture all of that and pull it together and run it as well as medical response evacuations and things for those. Um, and lucky enough to, to have an off or whatever it might have been throughout the event um, was was pretty cool experience. Easy and looking after fifty five staff and I wouldn't say so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm really lucky. We've got a great yeah. team. Um, yeah. We we pride ourselves on you know, loving who we go into battle mm. with every day on a daily basis, yeah. and um, I think that makes a big difference. So you know, just wanting to be around the people you work with does make a difference. And yeah, um, yeah. You know, we talk about automation. You talk about everything else that you can do and software and systems and scalability and quality, none of that happens without having a dedicated, awesome team on the ground. Yep. And uh, everyone's got to give us stuff and that's something we look for in our mm -hmm. team. Um, and we, we, you know, we don't apologize for that, but mm -hmm. I think in return, everyone on our team respects each other so yep. much because of that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we're pretty lucky in that space. No, it's, it, it's a great environment uh, that, that you've all built there and um, it's a very interesting journey you've been on uh, to where it's got you to today and you've obviously done a, a really, really great job with a with a big and well-known business within the Australian turf industry. Uh, so, it's a credit to you and it's a credit to the entire team at Coolabar Turf. So, um, I think we um we covered turf, we covered IT, and we covered rally cars. So I think we're pretty good. Yeah, hopefully, I don't know. I guess some people might have taken something out of a bit of that. <laughs> yeah, no. um, but um, yeah, it, look, it is pretty diverse. But I think um, yeah, we we had a group of young uh, young guys from a local school through our business um, a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I said, oh, who wants to be a turf farmer? And no one put their hand up. And yeah. I said, oh, who wants to work in? You know, went through all the facets of our business, and they all sort of stood there blank faced. Yeah. And I said, it doesn't actually matter because what you guys decide to do when you leave school, I guarantee you probably won't be doing it in 20 years there yep. might be one or two that are but mm -hmm. basically go out there do something that engages you have fun it really is a great industry to be part of you know we we do say we're changing lives one backyard at a time mm -hmm. or one sports and recreation field or one local park mm -hmm. um and we just love seeing that smile that comes on someone's face um when our drivers turn up and they've got the kids and the dog there and yep. we're trying to wrangle them back because the forklift's going to yeah. get the turf off the truck um but it, it does it just brings a smile to people's face and they can take their yard from you know a bit of dirt to a finished product they can be out playing on it or letting the dog run around on it or laying on it whatever they want to do yeah. um within the same day so it's a pretty cool industry to be part of um and um yeah obviously being part of lawn solutions mm -hmm. and what we get to share in with you guys is important to us as well so yeah, um, it's great yeah it's no, a good journey it's, um, if you if you want to check them out it's coolturf.com.au or, or cool bar turf on on all the socials um you can see they cool bar turf bring the human element into it really really well you just explained it just then, so it's definitely worth checking out and following their journey but um Otherwise, we might wrap that up there. Thanks for sharing your story, Scott. It's, a, it's an interesting one, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of benefit for a lot of people tuning in today. So appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for your time. Cheers.